Hey everyone, Simon Loveday from Ag Research New Zealand here. Just going to share with you a talk that I gave at a conference called Protein Tech a few years ago about alternative proteins. So here we go. Okay, so the talk is called Alternative Proteins, Alternative Facts. And this recognizes that in the alternative protein space, uh, there are some, some myths and some alternative facts that I'll, I'll get onto a bit later. So we're gonna have a look at four different areas. Um, in the top left, some of the hazards associated with novel proteins, novel food proteins. In the bottom left, some of the sustainability issues and questions. In the bottom right, some uh, nutritional aspects and in the top right are uh, represented by those um, symbols of wealth, the flat screen TV and smashed avocado. Um, we're gonna look at, um, well, no, we're not gonna look at any of the economic or, um, or financial aspects because those are not science. Okay, starting with nutrition. These are the, uh, the 20 amino acids that humans uh, need. And uh, the essential ones are circled in blue, the indispensable amino acids that we have to get from our diet that our bodies can't synthesize. And these are important because uh, the, the amount and availability of these varies from, from different foods. When we talk about the bioavailability of amino acids, so how well we take them up into the body, two aspects become important. The amino acid content in the food and the amino acid digestibility. This is looking at the content of leucine in various different foods. Leucine is an amino acid that's very important for muscle synthesis, uh, for athletes, for, for muscle gym bunnies, um, and also for, for seniors for um, maintaining muscle function and mobility. And surprisingly, if we look at the graph, um, sorghum, millet, and maize are very high in leucine. And we don't think of these as very um, nutritionally rich uh, sources of protein, but uh, turns out they have a lot of leucine. Why do we not um, consume leucine to put on muscle? Well, the answer lies in the true allele digestibility, which is how much of a, an amino acid consumed is actually taken up. And we can see that for sorghum, the true allele digestibility is actually very low. So even though there's uh, of, of the protein in the sorghum, a relatively high proportion is leucine, the, the amount of protein in sorghum is relatively low and the digestibility of, uh, of the sorghum protein is, is very low. And these two aspects brought to, are brought together in this uh, concept called the digestible indispensable amino acid score or DAS. So uh, in the, the numerator, it, it, it incorporates the, um, the content of a given amino acid. And in the denominator on the bottom, it talks about the digestibility. And DS score, DSs are calculated for each amino acid, each, each of those indispensable or essential amino acids. And then the lowest DS for the indispensable amino acids is the overall DS for the, uh, the foods. And here are some examples of, of DS values for various different foods, uh, protein containing foods. And we can see that the, the milk and the whey are right at the top. So a very rich source of protein reflecting both high digestibility and a good um, source of essential amino acids. Soy is pretty good, DS about 0.9. Pea protein is pretty good. And then we drop down at the, the bees, peas, peas, beans and rice and the cereals um, much lower DS. Right down the bottom, corn-based breakfast cereal without milk, which may or may not be cornflakes, um, DS of 0 0.012. This reflects the very low lysine content of corn. However, if you add milk onto your um, breakfast cereal, which may or may not be cornflakes, uh, the DS jumps up to 1.07. And this is one of the key concepts I'd like to, to emphasize here, the nutritional synergy of proteins. So the, uh, the milk proteins contributing um, methionine, cysteine, lysine, and bringing up the overall um, nutritional value of that meal despite the very low uh, lysine availability from corn. Speaking of milks and milk-like substances, um, here's a comparison of the protein content of various different uh, milks and, and non-milk milks. You can see that there's uh, a group at the top, um, cow, sheep, goat, Ooh, cows there twice, um, and then soy. Um, 
and cow milk around about three, three and a half percent protein, sheep milk much, much higher protein, six percent or so, reflecting the much higher, more concentrated milk solids in, in goat milk and sheep milk. Goat milk similar to bovine, soy milk um, again similar to cow milk, and then almond, rice and coconut milk, much, much lower protein. These are not protein-based milks, they will not deliver uh, a good amino acid um, uh, intake, uh, and, and they shouldn't be considered as a, a protein-based food. Now, but does this matter? If you, if you um, are a healthy individual getting plenty of protein in your diet, does it matter that the, you like almond milk on your corn-based breakfast cereal? Um, probably not, if you're getting enough protein already. But for some populations, protein intake is really crucial. And for, for seniors and children in particular, um, the, the, the amount and quality of protein is really crucial to health. And so I, I, I suggest you should not feed your, your grandmother or your toddler coconut milk, rice milk, or almond milk. They are very, very low in protein. And the um, Food Standards Australia and New Zealand, the, the regulatory body covering Australasia, uh, requires these milks, these, these beverages to have this wording on the package not suitable as a complete milk replacement for children under five. The rest is the question of what is milk? Uh, and this has been thrashed out in the European Court of Justice. And the Europeans have concluded that uh, uh, milk uh, um, cannot be used on a purely plant-based product. In the US, the FDA has, uh, has this regulation that milk is the lacteal secretion of one or more healthy cows, which raises the question, what about goat and sheep milk and others? Um, the situation as I understand it is that despite this regulation, it hasn't been enforced. And so the term milk is being used on plant-based beverages quite widely. Uh, and the, the dairy industry is not very happy. And um, Timmy Baldwin is championing, well, back in 2017, was championing the enforcement of uh, this, this regulation. Coming back to the concept of nutritional synergy, one of the key take home messages, if you like. This is a study um, comparing the muscle fractional synthesis rate, so how, how much muscle you put on after a workout uh, in healthy young people um, who consumed either um, a protein blend containing casein and whey from milk as well as soy or consuming whey protein, which is commonly believed to be the best protein for muscle synthesis. And on the top left, you can see, um, this is a graph of the phenyl phenylalanine in the blood uh, over time after consuming these, these sources. <clears throat> um, and phenylalanine in this case is an amino acid that's just marking the, uh, the intake of, of uh, the uptake of protein into the blood. The whey protein, um, very fast uptake, um, very high amount of amino acids in, in, in the first hour. And then beyond the first hour, you get a, a dip. The protein blend had a, more, had a lower peak and then a more sustained delivery of amino acids over the, the next uh, two, three hours. And the result of this was that muscle synthesis lasted a bit longer with the protein blend compared to whey protein. So uh, having that, that initial peak is important, but having a sustained supply of amino acids to feed the muscles and, and support that muscle synthesis is also important. Speaking of synergy, here's a PhD student soon to submit his thesis, uh, Zhuang Zhujie. Uh, I've been working with him over the last few years on hemp proteins, so proteins extracted from the, the hemp seed um, material. And um, Zhujie has found that hemp proteins interact uh, synergistically with dairy proteins. Um, hemp by itself is very insoluble. The hemp proteins aggregate and precipitate, and that's shown with this, this turbidity uh, jumping up as we heat them at 90 degrees for several minutes. When there's a combination of uh, uh, caseinate with the hemp protein, the turbidity stays low, indicating solubility it remains high with this combination uh, despite heating. So technological synergy of hemp proteins and dairy proteins uh, supporting the combination of proteins together. You can find uh, Jujia's papers. He's published uh, three by now. All right, coming back to our, our um, four concepts, let's have a look at 
the sustainability aspects. Uh, this paper came out in, in, in Science in, in 2018. Uh, Pura Nemechek, um, big meta review of, of the, the footprint of various foods, including protein rich foods, and that generated various domestic headlines. Um, I love this one here the guy chomping down on a leaf of lettuce. Um, eating less meat could save the planet. Uh, and George Momio from the, the Guardian saying good, good riddance to livestock farming. Um, unfortunately, the, the, the situation is a bit more complex than the media would have us uh, believe. Let's have a look at some of the data from the poor and paper. So on the left, original data, um, kilograms CO2 per 100 grams protein equivalent. So this is, this is divided by the amount of protein in the food to estimate the, the, the greenhouse gas footprint. And you can see that um, beef uh, is, has massive footprint according to this data, cheese a little bit less, uh, the, the nuts um, uh, and pulses and tofu quite low. However, one key aspect that Pura Nemechek left out of this paper was the, um, the nutritional quality of the protein in the different protein sources. And we just had a look at the DS, which is the combination of the, the uh, richness and in indispensable amino acids with the, the bioavailability or the digestibility, true ileal digestibility of the amino acids. And, and this varies quite widely. Um, the plot on the right is showing DS uh, for the various sources ranging from, uh, no, hang on. Um, we saw DS a few slides back. If we, um, if we divide by DS, if we divide the footprint by DS, we're um, um, incorporating the protein quality into that footprint calculation. And when we do that, um, the figures change quite a bit in some cases. So we saw that the DS for, um, for milk was around about 1.2 um, divided by 1.2 and you get a, a reduced footprint. Um, Meat a little bit, a little bit higher than one. Soy milk we saw about 9.9, one. Um, peas, pulses, nuts, and ground nuts quite a low DS. So when we divide by a low DS, we get an increase um, up to about 130% increase for the ground nuts and the nuts. Peas and pulses also increased um, somewhat. So when we incorporate the the greenhouse gas emission and the footprint and the the protein quality, things change a little bit. Um, Beef is still ahead of the herd with the fairly high greenhouse gas emission. Cheese is a bit lower. Groundnuts are quite a bit higher. Nuts and pulses are quite a bit higher. And we now see that milk, um, so bovine milk, is now comparable with the nuts, pulses, um, and tofu. So I think it's really important to incorporate that protein quality into any um, uh, calculations of, of footprinting of protein-based foods. And this is published in a, 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 an article I wrote in Annual Reviews in Food Science and Technology in 2020, 2019. All right, moving on to cultured meat and meat analogues. These are two very different things. Um, they get confused, they get mixed up. Um, lots of terms floating around. Petri meat, in vitro meat, clean meat, cellular agriculture, uh, meat mimics, mock meat, meat-free meat. Free meat. Textured vegetable protein, that's an odd one. And then somewhere in the middle, we have fake meat, synthetic meat, and lab meat, which I think are completely useless terms because they don't specify what they're referring to. They're ambiguous, they're meaningless, let's chuck them away. Okay, cultured meat and meat analogues. In the blue corner, we have cultured meat. No, nope, let's go into the red corner first. Okay, this is another PhD student. Um, he's published recently on um, the plant-based meat analogs with um, meat-derived flavors. So he's been hydrolyzing uh, meat materials and putting them into um, meat analogs to, to give that meat-like flavor. This is Jihong Chiang. Uh, Jihong now works at the uh, ASTAR in Singapore. He did his PhD at Massey University. So he's been putting um, meat into non-meat meat analogs. Um, you might ask, what's the point? Uh, because this recognizes that meat analogs have a much wider um, potential market than, than vegans and vegetarians. Um, and the, the flavor of meat analogs has really been quite poor. So why not add some, 
some real meaty flavors into them. And you can find Ji Hong's papers. Some of the companies um, in the cultured meat space in the blue corner, Memphis Meats, New Harvest, Mosa Meats, in the meat analog corner, um, Impossible Just, New Wave, Sunfed, and, and Beyond Meat. And let's have a look at what, what are these, um, what is cultured meat? Here's a nice figure uh, that I stole from somewhere. I th I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't remember where, sorry. Um, this uh, Mark Post, one of Mark Post's papers, I think. Uh, so skeletal muscle is, is taken from a, an animal. Stem cells are harvested, uh, grown up in culture and given cues to differentiate into muscle cells. The muscle cells are, are applied towards a, a scaffold and uh, differentiate into um, fibrous muscle-like material. And you will have seen various pictures in the media of, like on the left, um, this is not uh, cultured meat. Somebody has uh, got hold of a nice piece of, of uh, schnitzel, chopped it up and plonked it in a petri dish and taken a photo for, uh, yeah, for sensational purposes. This is fake news. This is not cultured meat. On the right hand side, this is cultured meat. This is what uh, meat cells growing in a petri dish look like. Um, much less like meat. And uh, a few years ago, um, uh, Professor Mark Post um, created enough of these tiny little strands of muscle, um, stacks and stacks and stacks of them, as you can see, to create one burger patty. And that one burger, pat burger patty uh, required roughly a quarter of a million euros to, to create. So this was not economic at the time. Uh, this was a number of years ago. It's becoming much more economic now, but I think you'll still find, I saw um, uh, an opinion piece on the, the cultured chicken nuggets. Um, and there, there's something like $50 per chicken nugget. Now you can pop down to McDonald's and pick up pack of chicken nuggets, real chicken nuggets for as real as chicken nuggets are, not that they're real, um, for, <laughs> for a few dollars. So I think this is, this is some way off being, um, being viable, being uh, economic at this point, but we shouldn't rule this out as, as possibly um, becoming economic in the near future. So we'll see some patty type burger products before too long. Um, nuggets and, and comminuted meat is the is the common is the, the technical term. These comminuted meat products have essentially no structure. They're like they're from mints. And so um, making a, a mince-like product with very little structure is not as challenging as making a steak, with, which has, um, as well as muscle tissue, it has fat, it has blood vessels, connective tissue. Um, the, 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 they're arranged in a very specific structure. Um, there's a whole lot of vitamins, minerals, and other micronutrients present in, in meat that are not present in cultured meat. And at, at this point in time, January 2021, uh, cultured meat requires fetal bovine serum from dead calves, so not very uh, ethical at this point in time. All right, uh, let's segue into insects. Now, uh, if we look at the protein content of insects, some of them are quite high, and this is a, 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 a plot of the, the protein as a percentage of dry matter uh, for various protein rich materials and dry matter means if you if you take uh, say a flower containing protein you dry off the moisture um, it's a proportion of what's left if you take um, crickets contain some moisture if you dry them down you look at the, the percentage of the dry matter that's what we're talking about here and if on the far right hand side beef if you if you dried beef you'd find that 80 percent of the dry solids of beef are protein um, Soy protein isolate, whey protein isolate, these are powders about 90% protein already in dry form. Skim milk powder, about 30% protein. And various, pro various insects here, crickets about 65% protein. So quite a rich as, as insects go, uh, richer than skim milk powder. And you'll see the claim in some uh, marketing material that cricket flour contains more protein than steak. Um, this is fake news. And the reason I say that is that if we compare on a on a even playing field, so a dry matter content, um, cricket 65%, beef 80%, uh, 
it's uh, it's pretty clear. Um, where there is a difference if you compare dry cricket flour with moist beef, beef's something like 70% water. And if you compare dry with wet, uh, yes, there's more uh, protein in, in dry cricket flour than wet steak. But if you, if you even the playing field, uh, this turns out to be fake news. Bonus points for who can tell me uh, what this is. It's not a cricket. That's right, it's a locust. Moving on to squishy things. Um, this is a, a tobacco hornworm on the top right hand side. And it turns out that uh, cultured insect meat is, is quite interesting. Um, if we move away from cultured mammal meat, so from uh, pigs and chickens and cows, uh, we move on to, to insect meat, cultured insect meat. And this paper came out um, 2014 and they were culturing the muscle cells from tobacco hornworm. Uh, and they found that the muscle cells assembled very nicely into 3D structures without extracellular matrix, so the scaffold that mammalian cells require. And they survived a lot better in um, culture medium than mammalian cells. So, and if you go into the uh, supplementary material for this paper, you can see um, videos of these little culture cells twitching spontaneously. So they are behaving like real muscle cells. So cultured insect meat, why not? All right, are there any hazards with these novel proteins? Um, well, stepping back, what, is the, what do the regulators think at this point in time? And this, this point in time was 2017, 2018, when this presentation was put together. At the time, uh, novel food regulations applied to, to insects. So if, if an insect had not been consumed traditionally for, for at least 50 years, you had to prove that it was safe in the EU. Um, similarly, in China, there's a novel food regulation. Uh, USA grass status. New Zealand and Australia, again, traditional use is, is evidence of safety. And a few, a few uh, insects have been approved for um, consumption and sale in, in New Zealand, Australia. Um, and in some jurisdictions, insect-based animal feeds are permitted. Hazards of eating insects. Um, I'm not suggesting that insects are dangerous in and of themselves, but I think we need to be um, really careful and, and aware of the hazards when we look at new protein sources. And this goes right across insects to other cultured meats, other um, novel proteins from, from plants and so on. Allergenicity is a potential problem. So in the case of insects, uh, there is cross reactivity between uh, chitin bearing insects like crickets or locusts. Uh, and crustaceans, dust mites, and shellfish. So if you're allergic to shellfish, um, keep away from crickets. Endogenous toxins and anti-nutrients. So um, insects and, and plants um, often secrete or, or produce toxins to protect themselves from predators. We need to be aware of the, the potential for these to, to poison people. Surface contamination, when you, when you uh, slaughter an insect and uh, uh, a cricket, for example, you, you're grinding up the whole insect, including the anything on the surface. Uh, so any surface contamination carries through into the cricket flower. And you're also um, carrying over the digester inside the insect. And so anything that the insect has consumed, any kind of microbiota will, will carry through into the um, insect-based protein um, plant uh, food material. So we need to be aware of uh, microbes and toxins that might be lurking in the guts of these locusts and crickets and hornworms. Uh, here's a, a, an overview of some of the hazards associated with novel foods uh, and insects, microalgae, seaweed, duckweed, and so on. So I'm not saying these are, these are dangerous. I'm just saying let's, be, let, let's open, have our eyes open to the potential hazards with these new protein materials. And just to, to, to show you that this is not um, overly conservative, Here's a paper from 2012 um, uh, surveying the content of protease inhibitors in uh, soy-based infant formulas. So protease inhibitors um, inhibit the enzymes that digest protein in our guts, and they therefore reduce the, the, the uptake of protein, um, the, the, um, how much nutritional benefit we get from protein we consume. So they're, they're a hazard. And six out of eight of the, the soy milk formulas are surveyed in the study. Uh, contain residual trypsin inhibitor, so enzyme inhibitor activities, 
higher than the safe level. All right, so we've had a look at um, nutritional aspects, we've had a look at sustainability aspects, we've had a look at some of the regulatory and safety aspects, and we've ignored economic aspects. What are the takeaways? I love fish and chips. Um, protein quality matters. Remember that DS. Uh, so the, the, the content of the indispensable amino acids and the digestibility of those amino acids. Um, novel food brings novel risks. So we talked about the potential allergens, toxins, microbes, and so on that, that could be lurking in these novel protein materials. Beware of fake news. A lot of companies out there are, are marketing, um, trying to attract uh, venture capital. So we need to, to be a little skeptical, be a little uh, critical and cautious of some of these claims and seek out synergy. We've, we've shown some examples of nutritional synergy, functional synergy, sensory synergy. Um, let's look at the potential benefits of combining different protein materials together to give us the best of all worlds. So thank you for listening. I hope that was useful. Um, Feel free to contact me if you would like more information. Um, yeah, thanks for watching. Bye.